Hello and welcome to IDF's virtual education event, COVID-19, What Do We Know and What's Next? Thank you for joining us. My name is Kathy Antela. I'm the Vice President of Education at IDF and I'll be your host for today's virtual event. So now I would like to welcome our President and CEO of IDF, John G. Boyle, to personally welcome you. Well, hi, Kathy, and thank you uh, for the introduction, and uh, thank you and welcome to all of you who have decided to uh, spend part of your uh, evening with us. Uh, on behalf of the Immune Deficiency Foundation, I uh, really uh, am grateful that you have decided to uh, uh, join us for uh, this uh, uh, virtual education event. Uh, we're normally excited to host these uh, uh, these sort of events in your community, uh, but since that is not an option at the moment, we are uh, just grateful for the uh, the powers of technology and Zoom here uh, that are going to um, allow us and our presenter and our exhibitors and uh, everyone to just uh, be all together uh, today. Uh, we know it's been a very trying um, I was going to say number of weeks, but we're now up to uh, to really two months for many of us in, in dealing with this. And so it's just great to have uh, over 60 of you here together and with us. Uh, this pivot that we've been doing to virtual events uh, is not only important for where we are today with strange days and social distancing, uh, but ultimately where IDF is uh, going to be going in the future, uh, because we believe that using this approach will enable uh, us to ultimately connect with and provide information to uh, more members of our community. Uh, it's lovely to get together when we can, but uh, in terms of people who are sick, uh, if you're infusing, if uh, travel is a problem, any of those things, uh, we don't want you to be missing out on good information. So uh, the virtual approach is one we're gonna continue with uh, for the time being. Um, and this virtual event really did come out of uh, what you, our community, has requested. Um, and we're, you know, our commitment to you, as you can see, uh, you know, some of our, our core values, our guiding principles, and our uh, promise to you, our, our constituents, our community, uh, you know, are the elements that really make up this and all of our other programming. Uh, you know, we, we try to be a trusted resource, uh, use technology, use innovation to the best of our ability, especially when um, uh, COVID-19 uh, necessitates that, um, but also to just build a community and uh, one that, uh, th that's built on uh, compassion uh, because, you know, we are all in this together. And, uh, you know, it, this is a, 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 can be a very trying time for many of us. And so uh, seeing each other, uh, getting to uh, deal with a few things in common here, uh, we find is, uh, is, is worthwhile and uh, folks have been uh, asking us for it. So uh, here we are. And in terms of what folks have been asking for, our ability to provide, uh, you know, uh, this programming and much other uh, uh, work that we do is, uh, uh, happens in no small part thanks to our sponsors. And so I'd like to thank the sponsors of uh, this event. Uh, this includes our, our core service leaders, CSL Bering, Griffles, and Takeda, uh, our core service sustainer, Horizon Therapeutics, our national sustainer, Acredo, and then our national patrons, Diplomat Specialty Infusion, Kedrion Biopharma, CVS Specialty, Quorum CVS Specialty Infusion Services, Coru Medical Systems and Kaba Fusion. Now, once this meeting is over, and you know the hour and three quarters or so that we have together will move pretty quickly, um, the learning does not have to stop. Uh, we hope that, uh, especially if you're newer to IDF, you'll visit our website uh, to see all the resources that we have together uh, to offer uh, the publications, the online support groups, uh, updates about uh, upcoming events, uh, help with things that you may need help with, insurance, uh, uh, locating a physician, uh, and all of the different uh, pieces that are out there. Uh, there's so much that is going on, especially uh, these days. Uh, and so um, uh, if you uh, check out the website and check us out on social media, uh, you know, because the information moves quickly and sometimes that's the easiest way to inform each other, uh, the more ways that uh, we are in contact and we do consider it a two-way street of you learning from us and us learning from you, um, the more ways that we're connected, uh, we think the better. So um, with that, uh, I would just like to thank you for 
uh, being a part of our community, and especially as the world around us continues to uh, change and throw curveballs, um, and your participation uh, here, um, uh, telling us what you think about it, uh, giving us feedback afterwards, uh, will help us uh, to not only serve you better, but also other members of the community as we do more of these events and expand our programming, um, because we just want to make sure that as, as we adjust to the new normal, uh, we're doing what you want us and need us to do. IDF exists for you and, and only for you. So um, we want to make sure that that, uh, that sort of feedback is, uh, is, is coming uh, the whole time. Uh, so uh, with that, I would now like to uh, invite uh, Sean McCabe and uh, Dana Flathammer from Takeda um, at, for a quick word from uh, one of our sponsors. Sean? Uh, thank you, uh, and as always, John, uh, for yet another opportunity to uh, engage with the community. Um, just for everyone's awareness, we're trying to attend as many of these as possible to ensure, most importantly, that we're listening. And uh, it just as, as most important component of that is to hear your voice as well. So uh, looking forward to an opportunity as we move into breakouts, um, albeit uh, quick five minute turns, just to make sure that we're addressing any and all needs and questions. Uh, myself and Dana Flanhammer, who leads our patient community support team, will be in attendance. And uh, just a, a huge kudos to the IDF uh, for transitioning these into the virtual environment, recognizing, of course, anything but ideal circumstances out there and what's, what's driving the need, but really, uh, really, really important to be able to fill this gap. So thank you for the IDF for being so responsive in the inclusive nature of it. Thank you, Sean, and thank you, John, for that um, wonderful welcome. Now, please remember, as we get started tonight, that um, the information presented during the event is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, and that we're here today as a trusted source and friend to provide you with information that can be used to help understand this rapidly evolving situation. So we encourage you to check our website often for updates. So now I would like to um, hand the program over to our medical presenter, Dr. Jennifer Lighting. Dr. Lighting serves as an immunology and allergy specialist for the University of South Florida Pediatric Allergy Immunology Program at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital and the University of South Florida Morsani College of Medicine, where she is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lighting. <laughs> Hi, this is an unusual introduction, but thank you for uh, the invitation to present to you all. Um, I feel like we're amongst friends and so, I will uh, try to get through the information as easily as possible and try to not make too many formalities about this. I do give full disclosure that my six and nine year old are running outside that room, that door. And you, some of you may have seen me on the phone and that was me uh, threatening death to my husband if they weren't quiet. So <laughs> I, am, I will try my best, but I make no promises. So uh, with that, I'm happy to start. Um, so I, I titled this, uh, talk of COVID-19, where we are now and where we are going, um, meaning, you know, there's still a lot of unanswered questions um, that our communities, uh, medical and non-medical, are facing, and hopefully I can give some answers uh, to some of those questions, but there are still probably 100 more remaining for everyone that we have an answer to. Um, so the, the objectives of this talk are um, that we're going to go over clinical symptoms of, co of the syndrome of COVID-19, uh, discuss the um, potential immune response to COVID-19 and possible treatments that are being looked at, um, and sort of the hypotheses uh, behind how they work. Um, so I took a moment, I, as I was creating the slide deck, I, I wanted to take a moment to really uh, give a shout out to the team that I belong to, which is all medical and healthcare providers. I really think that um, there are those who are outspoken and those who are not. And we have joined, um, you know, many years ago for me, an elite club of, of people who have the opportunity to really try to make a difference. And this is where we get to shine. Um, and so I've enjoyed seeing these different memes and images that pop up on, you know, social media and Google and wherever you're looking. 
um, really depicting that. So I, I, if you haven't, you should call your immunologists or doctors when you do speak to them. And we love um, knowing that you all are thinking about us and um, uh, we're taking on new roles too. So, so we're all in this together as, uh, as John uh, said. So diving right in, um, uh, this uh, slide really is going over what the origin of the SARS-CoV-2 virus is, which is the virus that causes COVID. Um, and you can see down at, this is pulled right out of the Nature paper that was published just weeks ago, um, describing um, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And you can see down at the very bottom of the slide, um, uh, there's a, a little figure A. It's showing the genetic overlap between other viruses that have been uh, found in certain animals. And so, as you may have heard on the news or other outlets, um, this virus overlaps with two viruses found in bats and then even in pangolins, which is an animal I'd never heard of until uh, the, this virus. Um, and, and in both cases, they're not identical to those viruses, but extremely similar. And so some of the places where things that we are going to talk about in this talk that become important are this receptor binding domain that I have in a, in a red square. Um, and this is part of the virus that binds to human receptors and allows for um, propagation and infectivity. And then another place that is a little bit important that comes up as far as treatment is the spike part of the virus um, that you see in the upper uh, picture. Um, so part of this manuscript when it was first came out was also to, to really um, let people know that this is not a manufactured virus, that this virus came from um, animal predecessors and crossed over into humans. And so uh, this is the data behind that. So please, um, you know, know that that is the case, that this was not something that was man-made. Um, how is uh, uh, COVID uh, transmitted? So you, you can see this is our bat um, in the upper left. And then um, the pangolin is, is this animal that I still don't know much about, to be honest with you, is in the upper right, but there's good, great images on Google if you wanna look it up. And the thought is, is that these viruses cross between these animals and we think occurred potentially in marketplaces in China uh, where there is exposure to fresh animal meat and animals. Um, and that's the working theory. And then at some point, this virus then crossed into humans, which is my stick figure here. So how is the virus transmitted? It's transmitted through aerosolization. So aerosol drops, that's typically comes out when somebody coughs or sneezes, respiratory droplets. It also can be transmitted through contaminated surfaces. Now those surfaces typically get contaminated from aerosolized droplets. There's this possible fecal oral route and it doesn't appear that any cases of transmission that way have been um, described yet. But however, we do know that the virus can um, uh, exist in fecal um, samples, and so we know that that's possible. The, the question of vertical transmission has not been answered. Vertical transmission is when a pregnant mother passes a virus to her fetus, as can occur in other viruses, uh, most notably HIV. And so it doesn't appear that that's the case right now, and that there have been several women who have delivered babies who do not have um, COVID-19. However, it's still unclear whether that's totally worked out yet. So this is, I pulled this uh, data from, there's a uh, website on the Johns Hopkins um, uh, web, and you can actually, anybody can access this. So if you, if you want, we can always send you the link. Um, but it shows it, and it updates multiple times a day. So this was as of yesterday, uh, showing the total number of cases worldwide. And you can see it's about 4 million. Um, and then total number of deaths, and I have that in the right panel. And so we're at about 285,000, give or take, worldwide. And you can, it also um, uh, distinguishes between countries and how many confirmed cases by country. And um, as of yesterday, the, the U.S. continued to lead um, in that as far as number of cases. So let's talk about symptoms of COVID-19. So um, most of these symptoms, I'm sure a lot of you have seen through different um, news outlets. 
but the number, the, the most notable symptoms are, are what's listed actually in the bottom right, these fever, cough, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing. Some patients have described this as uh, uh, difficulty breathing similar to like an asthma attack where they can't get air in. Um, they're kind of air hungry. They posture in a way so that they can get more air into their lungs. Um, there have also been chills associated with fever and then repeated, repeated shaking with chills um, where, you're ha where you're having whole body shaking. Uh, there's been muscle pain uh, associated with the, the virus as well as headache, sore throat, and then this new loss of taste or loss of smell, meaning you didn't have it prior, prior to infection. Um, there have also been a few um, uh, complaints of diarrhea, although that's not been pervasive of in those that have been reported. So this is just showing a little bit about what acute respiratory distress syndrome is. I, I noted the difficulty breathing. And so the difficulty breathing is a symptom of what is acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. And you can see from um, the image on the right, this is what CT scans look like. They're listed as A, B, C, D. These are four separate patients from two time points. So the left and the right are two separate time points. And, and lungs are full of air typically, and so they're supposed to look black. When we start seeing white inside the lungs, that's when we know uh, there's, there's something wrong. And so you can see, um, at least in this top panel, the A panel, there's lots and lots of white that doesn't belong there. So when we have this, you start seeing things like low oxygen levels um, in the blood, difficulty breathing, and very short of breath. At a point will come um, in certain patients where they're not going to be able to breathe on their own and they'll need mechanical ventilation to assess that. So a new finding that's recently kind of come out, and I'm not sure if a lot of you have heard of this, is the skin findings associated with COVID-19. And this has been, there's one publication that came out that I um, referenced below, but that is even just days old, um, showing the different, different skin findings. And so what you can see in this, uh, the percentages I list are the percentages that they noted in this manuscript, and this was mostly a large cohort of patients out of Spain. And you can see that the, the top one, they call this the COVID toes or a chill blames, which is the, the medical term for it. It's these red findings on the toes. You can see it on the fingertips as well, and it occurs in nearly 20% of patients. They were also able to explain that with these certain rashes, so the chill blames specifically, um, lasted about 13 days, and it often appeared later in the course of disease and was actually associated with less severe disease. So they did see that in their, in their cohort. Um, other types of rashes, so there were, there were vesicular rashes, I don't have a picture of that there, but vesicles are, are, are usually fluid-filled bumps and they would occur anywhere on the skin. Um, they did note in this article that um, vesicular rashes were occurring mostly in middle-aged patients and lasted about 10 days and more commonly appeared before onset of the rest of the symptoms. So it sort of preceded the viral infection. The hive rash, so there's a picture of that you can see of somebody's arm, hives, I think most of us know what those are, they're itchy. Um, and then this maculopapular rash, which occurs in about 50% of patients. This is a pretty common finding with disseminated viral infections. So even some of our own immune deficient patients may have seen rashes like this when they've had just normal respiratory infections, uh, getting a rash. I will say that from this article, um, the, the um, hive-like rash and the maculopapular rash um, tended to appear at the same time as the rest of the symptoms and were associated with more severe disease. Um, and then lastly is what we call levito. Levito looks almost like petechiae. Um, it looks like bruising and it can occur anywhere on the body as well. And in those patients that had levito, um, they tended to have more sev severe disease and it was associated with higher mortality. So it is that some of these skin findings are, can be, can help kind of predict what might happen. So a lot of questions have come up about pediatric patients, again, all over the news recently, um, in Kawasaki disease. So Kawasaki disease is a um, common, common among the uncommon, although I think we're all used to that, um, disease of children that is not associated necessarily with immune deficiency. And it's a syndrome, so it's a constellation of symptoms, many of which I've listed here, fever, rash, conjunctivitis, 
uh, swollen hands, cracked lips. Um, and some of the major problems associated with Kawasaki can be inflammation of the heart or the, or the coronary arteries around the heart. And so when children get diagnosed with Kawasaki disease, they often need echocardiograms to look at their heart. And the number one treatment for Kawasaki disease is IVIG. So we give IVIG in pretty high doses and we can sometimes abort the symptoms of Kawasaki disease. There's no known genetic predisposition or cause of Kawasaki disease in general pediatrics. And so what has now been termed is this COVID inflammatory disease in children is very similar to Kawasaki disease. So they're seeing similar symptoms of Kawasaki disease, including the heart problems, the inflammation of the heart itself, um, that has led to several deaths. So it's, it's sort of a new reported phenomenon within uh, COVID-19 that seems to be affecting primarily children. Um, so in those who have had Kawasaki disease, it's been, again, just recently reported, some children had, in addition to the normal COVID-19 symptoms that I just went over, had more pronounced GI symptoms, including diarrhea and abdominal pain. They had kidney injury and cardiac dysfunction. And the treatments that have been used in these children include um, IL-1 and IL-6 blockade, IVIG, and steroids. And there have been children that have lived, just be, this is not a death sentence, I don't want anybody thinking that. There have been children who have gotten this and who have lived with those treatments, but some have also died. And I'm going to go into what each of these treatments are in, in slides coming up, so don't, don't worry if you're unfamiliar with what I'm talking about. Okay, so who gets more severe disease? So what we know right now is um, older age, really above uh, 40s, 50s, those are the folks, and, and even into the elderly, those are the folks who have more severe disease, and then children less than one. So we're not seeing severe disease outside of this Kawasaki phenomenon in children, um, really up to the age of 18. Um, uh, so that's that's great. Um, obviously, though, the older population is um, more effective. Underlying conditions that seem to put people at risk include chronic lung disease, hypertension, kidney or liver disease, smoking, and obesity. And what you don't see on that list is immunodeficiency or being immunocompromised in any way. So having cancer doesn't seem to predispose you to this. Having a primary immune deficiency does not seem to predispose you to this as of what we know now, which obviously is still... Um, lacking in a lot of ways. So the incubation period is about two to 14 days from exposure once a person has become infected, and they are typically symptomatic within 11 days. That is why you hear this 14-day quarantine rule. When, when you've been exposed to somebody who is COVID positive, you're put in quarantine for 14 days with the expectation that you will become symptomatic during that time frame and, um, and know that you are infected. Okay, so I'm switching gears a little bit to talk about diagnosis. And I think I put this slide in here because I think it's important for us to know what emergency use authorization is. And this is specific to the United States FDA. So this doesn't exist outside of the United States. But in the US, the FDA is allowed to make emergency use authorizations during crises, during pandemics just like this. And it allows the FDA to give approval to, to companies or individuals um, for different things, right? And that can be medications, that can be diagnostics, and that company or individual is responsible for providing some data to the FDA to show that it's got some validity behind it, that doing this test leads to this. Um, however, it is uh, definitely sidetracking the normal avenues of testing and validation. And so you have to know that going into this, right? That a lot of the tests we're doing have not been formally vetted, have not necessarily been published, and this is, um, it's being done in a crisis situation. Now the company and all these individuals have uh, responsibilities to report back their data back to the FDA to eventually get that approval process, but you're not going through the normal channels that you would see for any drug or device that we're used to seeing outside of a pandemic environment. Um, so what do you do before we get to the testing? What do you do if you think you have COVID? So the first thing you do is call your doctor. We're all available. We're more than available. We want to hear from you. And so your doctor can really relay where, what you should do next. Every state, even every county is doing things a little bit differently. And so it's really important to stay local in those regards. 
there's more and more availability of testing. Um, and you know, this is a picture I have just, again, off of Google showing a drive-through testing facility. There's now antibody testing, which we'll talk about, and then self-quarantining. So PCR-based testing. This is the, the testing most of you are probably used to looking at. Um, what does this do? So you're taking a swab of respiratory secretions, most, mostly in the nose, and you can see even from this picture, this is the right way to do it. So the person testing you is literally cramming that Q-tip way back and getting a great sample, which is probably not the most comfortable thing in the world. Um, this method detects genetic information from the virus. You have to be infected to um, actually test positive. You don't necessarily have to be symptomatic. Those are two separate things, but you have to be infected. So it does not diagnose past infection or your susceptibility to infection in the future. Um, it also doesn't test infectivity, so it doesn't tell you how contagious you are. It's not like it's giving you a, a, a viral count. So you're not going to walk away saying, I have this many viruses inside me, and maybe if I had a higher number compared to my colleague, maybe I'm more infectious than somebody else. You don't know that based on this test. And it can miss people who have just become infected. So let's say you're on day one of illness and you don't really have, you're not very symptomatic, you're not really making respiratory secretions, you don't have a high, roll, high viral count, well, you can theoretically test negative, um, but still actually be infected. Uh, the turnaround is very dependent on where you are and what test is being run. And it can, in some places, it's same day within hours, you know, that's mostly in hospitals. And then in some of these drive through facilities, it can be longer. And I've heard upwards of about a week before you get results back. So the antibody testing, this is probably where there's the most um, unanswered questions. So as I just explained in this emergency use um, that the FDA gets to use, um, sometimes you have, you know, individuals and companies sort of coming out of the woodwork um, with, I have an assay and I can do this. And so right now there are more than 100 companies producing antibody-based tests. None of them are FDA approved. Some of them have gotten this emergency, you know, use authorization. Um, and what they aim to do is to measure IgM and IgG to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now, timing matters for when you actually check this. This is a, a blood test. So blood is drawn and sent out. Um, the further out you are from infection, the more likely you are to have a positive result. So if you are day four, day five, day six of infection, you may not have a positive IgG. So, so the, the higher, uh, like I said, the further out you are, the higher the sensitivity is to this test. So day 10, 11, 12 are probably the best days to measure this. Um, and it does not, again, does not diagnose infectivity. So this is only telling you that you had a previous infection. It doesn't say that you are currently infectious. Really, you need to know that time frame of the two to 14 days to, to know how contagious you truly are. Um, and this was, the, when we first got the antibody test, this was, I, I literally took this um, title right off the newspaper article. Early antibody testing suggested that COVID-19 infections in LA County greatly exceed documented cases. I'm sure most of you saw this all over CNN or Fox or wherever. And so this was based on testing of 863 adults, and they saw that 2.8 to 5.6% of adults made antibody to the SARS-CoV-2. And this equated to about 220 to 440,000 adults in the county that could have been infected, which is 28 to 55 times higher than had been predicted based on the current PCR-based positive test results. And so I think what this tells us is a lot, right? It tells us that uh, people make antibody to this virus. We know that now. It also tells us that this, this virus is probably much more widespread in communities than we were appreciating, which also tells us a little bit about mortality, that maybe the mortality isn't quite as high because obviously a lot of these patients were going on uh, not knowing that they were infected. So that uh, also about the antibody test, the other questions that remain include things like, do these antibodies actually kill virus? Do they take them out? We don't really know totally the answer to that yet. Do they prevent infection with the virus? So once you're IgG positive, does that mean you're never going to get COVID-19 again? So that is the case with certain viruses, like varicella. We get our varicella vaccine. We make IgG to varicella. And almost in no cases do you see repeat infection with varicella after you've gotten that vaccine. 
That is not the case with other viruses. Some viruses you can have IgG2 and then get re reinfected in the future. So we don't know the answer to that with COVID. And then how does this affect our community that cannot always effectively make antibody and we may, may not make IgG? We'll get to some of those answers in a little bit. Um, so the antigen-based test, this is the most new kit on the block. This is looking for molecules on the surface of the virus and it is mimicking it's similar to kind of the tests you get for the rapid flu or a strep test when you go to your primary care doctor and they swab your throat and they, they just do run it in the office. Um, it's much less sensitive, so there are a lot of false negatives, same, which is the case of the rapid strep and the rapid flu, not as sensitive. Um, and the FDA literally just days ago issued this EUA, the emergency um, exemption for this test. They are also stating that negative results should be confirmed with a PCR test. So it's helpful if it's positive, because you can say, yes, you have COVID. If it's negative, then, there, then the recommendation is that you still have that nasal swab, the PCR-based test, to actually confirm diagnosis. Making sure I'm staying on time. <laughs> so the immune system and COVID-19. So immune responses we know are mostly this T helper one type response. So T cells that make certain types of um, immunologic hormones or cytokines. They produce high amounts of inflammatory cytokines and they're responsible for direct killing. So again, the risk of reinfection, how long do, once we're infected, our immune system remembers this virus, but how long does that memory stick around? Do we get dementia early or do we hold on to it for years and years and years? And then again, the IgG, how long does that last after infection? Um, so we do know a little bit about patients with antibody deficiency. Isabella Quinty published a nice article that, again, just recently came out, looking at patients with AGAM or XLA and then CVID. Now, in the AGAM or XLA, those patients had no B cells, little to none. Um, and those patients all did well, and none of them needed anti-cytokine therapy or anything else. Uh, patients with CVID had dysfunctional B cells, and three of the five had what they considered more severe disease, which included respiratory distress, and they required anti-cytokine therapy. So having XLA uh, seems to not be, at least in this small report, um, a predisposing factor um, uh, for COVID. So the inflammatory disease. So what does this really look like? So the inflammatory disease has two phases. It's the cytokine storm you've heard of. So, so I always, the way I describe cytokine storm to, uh, to patients is you've basically started a freight train that's going 100 miles an hour. All your immune cells are activated. They're spitting everything out trying to clear this virus, but they don't care what's in front of them. So they will destroy normal tissue along with the virus just to get rid of it. And it does these through these things like IL-6 and TNF-alpha and interferon gamma. Um, and it leads to multi-organ failure if that inflammation cannot be restrained. The other thing that happens in, in hyperinflammation is you have this imbalance between coagulation with, and um, clot formation. So your blood system has this nice little balancing act where you're making clot, breaking down clot, making clot, breaking down clot. And that uh, prevents you from bleeding to death every time you get cut or from having clots like uh, DVTs and things like that. So when there's inflammatory disease and cytokine storm, that completely gets thrown off. And so you will have clots where they don't belong. You will bleed from places you shouldn't be bleeding from. Um, and that is associated with the elevated D dimer that we're seeing in labs. Other labs that have been helpful, people are looking at ratios because in COVID we're seeing that patients become lymphopenic, their CD8 T cell counts go down. It's unclear what the role of steroids is in all of this because some patients are getting steroids and steroids alone can make the CD8 count go down. So it's unclear if it's the COVID itself or medications. Regardless, the ratios of these neutrophil to CD8 T cells and neutrophil to absolute lymphocyte count seem to be predictive of disease severity. Uh, so those are other things people are looking at. So a little bit about what we can do. So obviously we're all in the social distancing together. I'm speaking to you from my office slash uh, school room for my six-year-old. <laughs> and um, 
Uh, and what do we do to flatten the curve? So we're doing it, right? We're, we're seeing at least in some communities where this is flattening. And, and remember, and I remind people of this a lot, that this flattening of the curve isn't necessarily gonna prevent people from getting infected. It's so that we're not all at the hospital at the same time. <laughs> and so that's what you can see in this healthcare utilization graph. And then the six feet apart, you can see the man coughing here. This has to do with how far aerosolized drops can go. So there really is a method behind this. It's not just some random number of stay six feet apart. It's because we think that you won't get infected if somebody coughs and they're far away from you. So talking a little bit about the anti-cytokine therapy. So I show here, um, this is just a little scientific schematic of the IL-6 receptor. So IL-6 is one of those cytokines I mentioned, and its receptors fix off the surfaces of cells. Um, IL Anti-IL-6 receptor, uh, one drug is called tocilizumab, and that has now been used um, effectively in, in many patients with COVID. We've also given the other ones under investigation include anti-TNFs like Remicade and Humira, anti-IL-1s, Anakinra, JAK inhibitors, which are a type of uh, anti-cytokine therapy as well. And all of these are under investigation. There's clinical trials that are opening up to look at how well these treat patients with COVID. And then the most recent thing that I literally just found today um, is a paper that was published about four days ago looking at a monoclonal antibody that binds to that spike portion of the virus. Remember, I pointed that out in my very first slide, um, and seems to be effective at treating COVID-19. And they are entering phase uh, trials through the FDA to get approval, and they're being fast-tracked. So that might be our biggest um, gun if it, if it truly works, but it appears to be working um, um, in the few, in the, in the lab. Okay, we've heard a lot about remdesivir. It is an antiviral medication. It's been given in some, it seems to reduce the recovery time. So it's not necessarily reducing infectivity, it's just the recovery time. And it doesn't seem to affect patients who have critical illness. Despite that, it is in phase three clinical trials and it's something that's out there that potentially could be used. Convalescent SARS-CoV-2 IG, a lot of people are asking about this. Um, so the FDA has, uh, has made available um, convalescent IG or plasma, for, which is plasma from patients who have been infected with COVID. Um, and the three ways that we can get that are through clinical trials. We can do something called expanded access where uh, basically many institutions are working off the same trial. Um, and then through single patient emergent permission, the way to do it for a single patient, they have to be eligible and those el that eligibility means they have to have confirmed COVID-19 and they have to have life-threatening disease, which the FDA defines on their website, mostly requiring a lot of respiratory support. It's still a little unclear about whether IG therapy is going to actively treat infections. There's multiple case reports where it's showing efficacy, uh, but it's not quite, you know, we're not sure how much is needed, the dosing, the timing, all of that has not been worked out. And it's unclear whether it will prevent future infections. So is giving somebody convalescent IG going to prevent them from getting COVID um, if they've never had COVID um, is unclear. Vaccines. So there are eight candidate vaccines that are currently in phase one trials, and they have all different platforms of how they think they're better than each other. Um, and I, the fact that all of these have opened in the last four months, I think, is an amazing feat of um, science, um, but obviously we're not quite there yet. So hopefully one will win out and will be our vaccine of choice. So what do, do now? what do we do now? So we continue with our social distancing. I still think that's a good idea, especially for the PI community. Um, wearing masks, especially when you're in places where there's gonna be more crowds that are unavoidable, like the grocery store. Um, wash your hands religiously and take your medications. Now is not the time to be non-compliant. <laughs> now is the time to be absolutely compliant with everything we're asking you to do um, so that you can be as protected as possible. Oh, and that's it. So um, with that, I know we have a Q&A and some questions. Uh, hopefully I'll address everything I didn't in my talk. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Lighting. That was wonderful. And we totally appreciate you sharing this information with our community tonight. Um, as a reminder, <coughs> excuse me, to participants, if you um, continue to have questions, type them in and um, we will answer as many of them as we can tonight. 
Now, before we continue, I would like to invite um, Dakota Fisher Vance from Horizon for a quick word from our sponsor. Hi everyone, my name is Dakota and I'm on the patient advocacy team at Horizon Therapeutics. I'm really excited to be here tonight and witness how incredibly adaptive and willing to continue to show up for each other the primary immune deficiency community is. As zebras, you may not be unfamiliar with medical emergencies and needing to stay home and sometimes miss out on events, but that doesn't mean it's not hard to feel isolated right now. However, IDF has shown us through the virtual events like this and through their proactive communications that you're never really alone when you're part of the primary immune deficiency community. So thank you to IDF for organizing tonight's event. Thank you to Dr. Lighting for taking time out of your busy schedule to present such an informative uh, presentation. And thank you for continuing to show up for each other during this really tough time. I'm looking forward to connecting further at our virtual event. Thank you, Dakota. Now, at this time, I would um, like to have Dr. Lighting answer some questions for us related to COVID-19 and the PI community. And thank you so much. My goodness, I can hardly keep up with your questions here. They're coming in like crazy. Uh -oh. um, we've been able to get um, a few of them on the slides. So let's go to um, the first slide, question slide. Does the flu shot or pneumonia vaccine provide any protection against COVID-19 or if those diagnosed with COVID-19 have received either or both of these vaccines have a milder case of the virus? Okay, so um, the short answer to both of that, that's like a multi-layered question, but the short answer is no, no and no. So uh, there are caveats to that though. There have been a lot of cases of COVID-19 where patients are, are co-infected with influenza. And so how influenza is interacting with, that, with the COVID-19 and what virus is causing you to be more sick is probably unclear. So you should certainly get vaccinated against what you can get vaccinated against. Uh, so I will put that plug in for the flu. The other uh, small piece of this is that um, patients with COVID-19 also are developing uh, frequently secondary infections related to this, so bacterial pneumonias. And so would getting the pneumonia shot prevent COVID-19? No, but it might protect you from some of the secondary infections that you potentially would be at risk for. So they're still worth getting, but they're not going to have primary um, prevention of COVID-19. Thank you. Next. I, I think you answered this one, but is, does IG therapy provide any protection from COVID-19? Do you have anything to add to um, your previous comments? Sure. I, I think it's unclear. Again, there's a few cases where it seems to be working, but it's unclear whether it will prevent COVID-19. So I don't know Thank the answer to that yet. Thank you. Next. How long will it be until antibodies to COVID-19 are in IG therapy products? So it takes from the, from the day a plasma donor gives their plasma until that product is available is, a, is roughly nine months. Now, many of our IG um, partners, IG producing partners have sort of vowed to be um, speeding this up in, the, in regards to COVID and to, um, to have donations from patients who have had COVID-19 where we have higher plasma but I still think we're probably months away from that being available in IG products. Many months away. Next. What safeguards are currently in place or should I make sure are in place when receiving IG therapy at a medical center via a home health nurse or when supplies products are shipped to my home for subcutaneous infusions? Yeah. So I'll answer the last part first. When things are sent to your home, um, you should do with them as you normally do, whether it's refrigerate or put in, you know, a normal storage area. Um, when, as far as going to a medical center or a home health nurse, it's very similar. So the medical center, I would ensure that they are um, having social distancing, that you're not sitting in a waiting room with 20 other people and making up hypothetical numbers, but that you're, um, you know, being that, that they are practicing social distancing um, and that there's good hand washing and mask wearing and things like that. 
As far as home health, that nurse needs to be practicing that. So she should, and the first thing she should do when she enters your home is wash her hands. Um, my guess is she's probably wearing, she or he, I should say, is probably wearing masks as well. Um, and I think just the typical normal hygiene, um, hand washing, masking um, should be implemented um, at both of those places. Thank you. Next. As places of employment, schools, and universities reopen, should individuals with PI consult with their immunologist regarding additional precautions that might be needed? Absolutely. There's not going to be one size fits all answer for, for our community. Every patient has different risk factors and nobody knows that better than you and your physician. So um, yes, you should talk to them about uh, what your risk is just based on your immune deficiency and then what your risk factors are, your place of employment, your, you know, whether you have children at home who are going to schools, all of those things are factors that will be considered in, in how uh, you uh, get back into the community. Okay, now we have um, some audience members that we would like to invite to um, ask their questions to Dr. Lighting at this time. So we continue to be um, typing questions as fast as we can here. So um, let's take a look at the next slide. There we go. And um, Beth, please go ahead and ask us your question. Thank, thank you, Kathy. Um, can UV light that typically kills other viruses kill COVID-19? As you can see, I'm sitting in the sunshine. <laughs> uh, so I, as soon as I saw this question, I was thinking, oh gosh, this is gonna end up on like Saturday Night Live or something. But um, so the answer is yes, ultraviolet light. So the, the, the study that was looked at was that was sun, basically that sun uh, things that were sun exposed or items that were sun exposed, the virus uh, was not living as long on those objects that were sun exposed. And so when you're talking about UV light, remember there are different types of UV. And so if you're comparing UV to sun level UV, yes, it can typically kill uh, the virus or it won't live as long, I should say, on inanimate objects. Um, that does not mean we should all be going to tanning beds or that we should have UV light centers in our homes uh, because it's unclear what that really means for the human body. Thank you. We have another question. The next question is from Lorraine. Lorraine, your question. Can the virus permanently damage your respiratory system? So, um, any virus can permanently damage your respiratory uh, system depending on how uh, badly it affects that organ system. Um, I think it's unclear what the long-term damage um, to patients who have severe infection with COVID-19 is going to be purely because they've, it's not been long enough. Um, you know, we've only had this virus around for now six-ish months. Um, so the answer is it's unclear. Uh, but really any virus, if it causes severe enough pulmonary disease, uh, can theoretically have um, uh, major damage. Thank you. Our next question is from Ruth. So Ruth's question is, does being asymptomatic improve your chance of survival? So, I don't think the two are linked. So being a, I don't know that anybody who's been asymptomatic has died. So theoretically, yes. Um, what your, what your, what, what are the causes of death have been primarily respiratory compromise and inflammatory disease. And by definition, those patients are not asymptomatic. So um, I don't know that it improves your chance of survival. I just think that you're not sick if you're asymptomatic. So by definition, you're surviving. I hope that answers that question. And our next question is from Brandy. Is it true that ibuprofen should not be taken if you're diagnosed with COVID-19? So that is not true. Um, early on in our uh, COVID um, pandemic, um, there were reports of patients being sicker uh, or having more severe disease when they took ibuprofen. And these were reports out of China where patients um, obviously felt bad we're taking self-medicating with ibuprofen, 
um, and um, ended up having severe disease. And I think now looking back retrospectively, those patients were probably going to have severe disease irregardless of the ibuprofen. There was also some talk about ibuprofen uh, potentially increasing infectivity of the virus that hasn't been, um, has not uh, seemingly uh, panned out the way it was initially thought. And so the, the WHO actually put a statement out recently stating that it was okay for patients to take ibuprofen. So um, it seems that it, it is okay to take. Thank you. Wow, thank you for your questions. There's more, there is absolutely more. And the next question is from Kelly. Um, if we don't produce antibodies, um, how will our doctors know if we've had the virus? So you'll know because you've gotten tested with that PCR-based method. So the respiratory uh, PCR test will test positive even if you don't make antibody. Um, so it is, that's why it's so important to go get tested. Um, if you feel sick or you feel like you've been exposed to somebody who has had COVID, it's really important to be tested especially in our community, our PI community, because so many of us do not effectively make antibodies. And unfortunately, in those who do, who do not effectively make antibody, you are correct, your doctor will not know of previous infection. The way they will know is because you got tested with that PCR test when you were symptomatic. Thank you. Now, questions keep coming in and we can't keep up with the typing, so I'm just going to ask these questions. Um, Dr. Lighting, Jeff's question is, Washington Post on May 10th has an article, doctors keep discovering new ways the coronavirus attacks the body. So there's a wide range of presentations and atypical symptoms. How do we deal with this broad range of symptoms? Yeah. So I, I haven't read that article, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I'd have to know exactly what it said, but I think, um, you know, the, how do we deal with the broad range of symptoms? I think you, you, you know your body the best, and when something isn't right, um, especially our PI community, you reach out to your doctor and get their advice and figure out if you should be tested. We are going to learn more and more about this virus. The more we look at it, the, there were, I'm, I'm sure the symptom list will keep growing. Um, and folks will have, there will probably be uh, symptoms that are more common and less common. Um, and the way we deal with it is if your body, something doesn't feel right, you contact your doctor and um, it's okay to get tested and have a negative result. At least you have a negative result. Next question. If a person tests positive for the antibody, can they still become an asymptomatic carrier? If they're negative for the antibody. So assuming that test, oh, they tested positive for the antibody, can they still become an asymptomatic carrier? So that's unclear, right? Because theoretically you could, worst case scenario, you could become reinfected and become an asymptomatic reinfected individual. Um, if the antibody, in fact, developing antibodies prevents future infection, then the answer would be no, you could not be a carrier. So those are the two scenarios, and I don't know what the answer to that is. I'm not sure the scientific community does yet. Thank you. Um, I just looked up that my Dupixian works on IL-4 and IL-13. So will this help with COVID-19? So very good, you are correct. That's what Dupixent does, <laughs> is it blocks IL-4 and IL-13? And no, it will not, it, well, as far as I know, it will not prevent infectivity. Um, and Dupixent is not a drug that is routinely used during cytokine storm because IL-4 and IL-13 are not cytokines that typically are associated with cytokine storm. And another person wants to know, um, they are on a prophylactic antibiotic, azithromycin, and they are on um, Zycam. Are those medications going to be helpful to them at all? In preventing COVID-19, no. Um, will they help um, in other ways? Potentially, but they're not gonna prevent infection with COVID-19. 
My teenage grandson who lives in the same house as me has been wonderful staying home for almost two months. However, now that the state has reopened, his mom and I are allowing him to go out and see his girlfriend. They're both wearing a mask and gloves, but should he or I be doing anything to keep me safe now that he's going out? Um, so kudos to you for having one of your children in your house for two months and actually saying it's a joy. <laughs> um, that's, that's number one. <laughs> number two, um, and uh, my, my second concern with this question is that teenagers, I would, I would doubt whether those masks and gloves are staying on. Um, and then, but if they are, that's great. And then lastly, so to answer your actual question of what you need to do um, is the same hygiene that everybody needs to do. So when he comes in um, from being out and about, he needs to wash his hands. I would even say maybe change his clothes, leave the shoes by the door, um, and that's it. And if he feels any kinds of symptoms, he needs to stay away from you. If, um, let's see here. If there are, are, do you have any other recommendations for additional PPE um, suggestions or provisions for PI patients? No, not really. Um, really the only things we've seen that have been effective at pre preventing transmission are the N95 masks. I know a lot of people are wearing surgical masks or cloth masks. It's unclear if they will completely prevent infection. Um, but they certainly prevent you from touching your face, which is another primary way of, of infecting yourself. So they do provide that benefit. Um, I think the wearing gloves in public is probably, you know, it's, it's really no different than having your hands and going and washing your hands when you're done. So I'm not sure that, that that's necessary, but there's not really anything else that you can do um, to prevent infection uh, short of that. Thank you. If you have the PCR test done, do they have to do both sides of my nose or just one? You know, I don't know the answer to that. I think it probably has more to do with sample acquisition. If they get a good enough sample, I, I don't, but I don't know the answer to that. I haven't seen it actually done myself. Um, usually I can say with other respiratory viruses, we've only had to do one side. So I'd be guessing though. So I don't, I'm not sure. Thank you. Will staying in quarantine reduce your, your immune system health? That's a good question. So I think, you know, there's a lot of links between um, psychological stress and the immune system. And so um, being quarantined, if you're not uh, handling it well emotionally, uh, could potentially have, provide some um, disadvantage there. But outside of that, no, it is not going to reduce your um, immune system or make you more likely to become infected with COVID because you are quarantining. My county is recommending that everyone get tested. I do not have any symptoms since I am not going out. So um, should I get tested? Um, I think you should do what your county tells you to do. <laughs> so if they, if they say you have to, you should. It's important for, you know, just as important as knowing uh, who's infected as knowing who's not infected because it's important for epidemiology so the community can make decisions on how they want to handle things. I have hypogamma globulinemia. I've been told that vaccines don't always work. Um, is that true? And I'm asking because once a, va a COVID-19 vaccine is found, Will I be protected? So those are great questions. So um, vaccines, um, so if you are a patient with hypogamma globulinemia and you're re receiving immunoglobulin, we typically recommend that, that patients do not need to receive routine vaccinations because they are getting that immunoglobulin, they're getting the protection to those infections from their immunoglobulin product. The exceptions to that most notably is the flu, flu vaccine. Um, so being on immunoglobulin doesn't mean that you won't respond to a vaccine. It depends on the mechanism of the vaccine. So certain vaccines patients can respond to regardless of whether they make antibody or not, and regardless of whether they're on immunoglobulin replacement therapy. 
So to answer your question is, it's gonna be unclear until we have that vaccine. Once we have that vaccine and we know the platform it is on, there will be recommendations for patients just like yourself who have either low IgG or are on immunoglobulin. Um, so that we need to just follow those recommendations once that vaccine becomes available. Is it safe for someone with PI to go to the dentist? I have a horrible toothache, but I'm terrified to see the dentist. So um, yes, I think it's safe to go to the dentist. I would caution that having an infection in your mouth is probably less safe than not, um, than having it dealt with. Most dentists and most communities are starting to open up and are very much practicing social isolation. So I would talk to your dentist and see if they can accommodate you in a different way. Maybe you're at the first appointment of the day or something like that to prevent exposure to other patients. But I, I wouldn't ignore the problem uh, just because of your PI. Thank you. Um, if a person is receiving um, IG therapy, what, would the antibody testing for COVID-19 be accurate? Unlikely. So it's, it's possible, it's also possible that it wouldn't be. Um, it, it depends on the person's ability to make antibody um, and, the, uh, and when they also receive their IVIG product. Um, right now we know that immunoglobulin products do not have a lot of COVID specific antibody, if any. Um, and so if the patient has the ability to make their own antibody, it might be able to be detected. But most patients who are on immunoglobulin replacement lack the ability to make antibody. And so you wouldn't be able to theoretically see that on a test. But there's a lot of um, or, uh, variables in that decision. Are UV devices really effective in keeping things like our cell phones germ-free? I don't know. <laughs> I feel like that's a rabbit hole. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I really don't know. Sorry. <laughs> okay. And let's see here. Um, in regard to plasma supply, do you anticipate any issues? I haven't heard of any. Um, I'm probably the wrong person to ask. Um, as far as you know, uh, some of the folks on the on this on this uh, virtual Zoom might be able to answer that better than us. Our sponsors is what I mean. Uh, but I have not heard that there's going to be a shortage or any issue. I think if anything, these companies are committed to you all and committed to providing. Um, safe immunoglobulin that will protect you even more than it already does. That's, that's the language I've heard. Do you think the virus will be worse in the fall? So I, again, I don't know. I hope it's not. Um, I think that if it is seasonal, it has the possibility of doing that. I guess it depends on how far we are with treatments, how far we are with the vaccination. Um, but I, but I don't know completely. Are we safe to go in swimming in pools? Will the chemicals in the pool kill the virus? So that's also not clear yet. So there are, you know, I brought up that oral fecal transmission. There have no, not been cases reported where it's been traced back to an oral fecal transmission, um, but it has been shown that COVID um, exists in stool um, of patients who have been infected for many days. So theoretically, they could be in a swimming pool and pass it that way. Um, that being said, I'm not sure that swimming is the, is the safest activity, uh, especially for patients with PI. I, I can say at least with my patients, I'm not gonna recommend that uh, for public pools at least. What is your feeling about herd immunity? So many of us don't know what to believe. Yeah. So we, we, our community relies on herd immunity. We rely on people who can get vaccinated to get vaccinated and, and um, uh, for those who are around us to be protected. I think that that will ultimately be the goal. Even as much as COVID-19 is affecting this country, the numbers are still much, 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 much too small to be providing enough herd immunity for us to all be protected. Um, it really has to be penetrable in the population. 
So it, my comments basically are that it, it, we will rely on it to get to that point at some point, but I don't think we're there anywhere close yet. Okay, and we have time for one more question. When I get groceries or meals delivered, do I need to wipe the bags and or packaging down with disinfectant or just bring the stuff in and then wash my hands? So there's no right answer to this. I guess it's the concern of how possibly infectious it could be. Um, I think that if they are items that you're not going to be using or grabbing very frequently, it's probably okay to not wash them off. If it's things that go right into your refrigerator that you use all the time, then you probably should wash those off. Um, I don't know that you need to wash bags. I would probably just bring them into one little area in the house and then unload from there. Um, and then maybe wash the floor where you had had them. Um, and then obviously washing your hands as you're unloading. Well, thank you to our wonderful presenter, Dr. Lighting. We know how challenging this time is, and we thank you so very much for your commitment and your support to our community. So to all of our participants, thank you for your questions, and please continue to send them in. We'll work on getting your questions answered. And then right now, I would like to invite Margie Peering from CSL Bearing for a quick word from our sponsor. Hi guys, my name is Margie Peering. I am from CSL Bearing and I have Hyzentra and Privagen. And I have loved attending these meetings live. Um, I'm the person behind the booth telling you guys, come and see me, come and visit me and trying to entice you with wonderful um, giveaways. Unfortunately, I don't have one. I'm gonna give you a virtual giveaway and say thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this really great opportunity. Um, I think the information prevented here was so valuable and um, I look forward to seeing you in the virtual um, meeting after this. Thank you, Margie. Now at um, this time, I would like to hand the program back over to um, John for closing remarks before our virtual exhibit call. Very good. Well, uh, thank you, Kathy. And thank you, especially Dr. Lighting. That was uh, great. Um, uh, you know, obviously some of the questions you could probably guess might be on people's minds and then some of them were, uh, uh, and thank you to all who asked your questions. I got to say the pool one is being discussed at our house a lot because summer is coming and uh, that's going to be one that's going to have an impact. So you, some of you might have seen my face drop a little bit at the answer uh, there. But no, this is this is the information that we need. Uh, and thank you, everyone who's uh, stuck around uh, so far. Well, um, now, uh, you know, our we've had our sponsors, you know, make some uh, little plugs. I'd like to make a couple for IDF if I can. Uh, first of all, uh, in terms of our uh, publications, um, we have... Uh, Next slide there. Uh, we have a whole host of uh, uh, materials. Many of you are familiar uh, with them. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, to make sure that you knew, especially about uh, the new uh, patient and family handbook. You can see that there on the left. Uh, it is available for download. It is a wealth of information. And for those of you who are newer to the community, uh, this was just updated. Uh, it uh, dropped digitally in December and in print uh, in, in uh, January. Uh, and uh, once we are all back in the office, we'll be happy to ship you one. Uh, at the moment, that's a little uh, tough. Uh, so I would say just download it, go to the website, and uh, please check that out. Um, in addition to our uh, printed materials and all of our, our information, um, we, we are big believers in how important it is to stay connected with one another. And, and Dr. Lighting had mentioned, uh, you know, the issue of, of sort of your mental health and those uh, who are, uh, you know, uh, dealing with isolation. We don't want you to be isolated. So uh, we want for you to uh, use uh, all of our different support programs. Uh, we have Get Connected uh, groups who are members of a local community, such as uh, many of the folks uh, here who are kind of from the, the same area, uh, more or less in Florida. Um, you know, 
the Get Connected groups are one uh, option. Uh, there are other programs out there uh, for providing peer support, uh, kind of asynchronous uh, uh, Facebook groups and idea friends. Asynchronous is a word that a lot of us uh, parents are using these days uh, because of uh, uh, school, unfortunately. Um, but there are all sorts of options out there. And we just encourage everyone to take advantage of it because uh, we do not want anyone here to feel alone. It's a little different, but you are not alone. And uh, we do have some resources and are happy to, to do all that we can to make sure that you are connected. Uh, and then if, uh, if the printed materials and the support programs uh, don't do it, uh, we always encourage you to just plain Ask IDF. Uh, we have um, uh, the uh, Ask IDF form, uh, which can help us to kind of route uh, your question and uh, get a, a quick answer to it as best as we can. But you can always just plain leave us a voicemail and we'll uh, pick it up uh, very quickly and uh, try to get you the best answer that we can. Um, and uh, in addition to all of this, uh, uh, you know, that we can do as we uh, have uh, uh, you know, these individual answers to your questions. If you liked uh, today, then uh, you and some of you said that you want more COVID-19 um, uh, uh, updates and other things like that. Well, we've got another uh, education meeting coming up in just a couple of days uh, that's centered around the Omaha area. But uh, geography is meaningless these days, so feel free to come on over uh, and take part. Uh, we just aim it towards a central time zone, so it'll be a little bit later for, uh, for us. So anyway, um, really that is all that I had to say, and so I want to just uh, thank our sponsors once again for uh, their support of our event. Um, well, anyway, thank you all. You've made it to the end here. Uh, just really appreciate uh, everyone uh, being here. I saw someone shooting me a, 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 a little private note saying that they'd taken six pages of notes, I believe. Um, I hope that this was valuable. Obviously, uh, we have uh, more of these on the way. Again, another one in just a couple of days. Uh, so uh, if you want a, a different medical professionals take on some of these issues, and, and we'll be getting into some other uh, topics as well, I believe, uh, just keep on coming back and go to primaryimmune.org, uh, check uh, our calendar of events. Uh, you know, we are going to uh, keep you updated about COVID, uh, but we're also going to be br uh, branching out into uh, a lot of other topics that you all um, are saying that you're interested in. So uh, thank you for all of this. Uh, stay healthy, stay safe, stay sane, and I look forward to seeing everyone uh, in person down the road, uh, but just know that if nothing else, uh, and as long as uh, Zoom does not fully crash, uh, we are here for you online, um, and again, if you ever need uh, just uh, another face outside of the, uh, the family members that you may have inside of your house or the furry creatures or anything like that, um, we are here and uh, we're here for you. So uh, for those of you who have not had uh, dinner, go and eat. You've earned it. Um, and uh, we'll see you next time. Take care, guys. Be well.